Today, I'm joined by a very dear friend of Gallup. She is an author, a diplomat, and a scholar, Dr. Ambassador Robin Renee Sanders. Ambassador, it's great to have you here today. Wonderful to be here. Ambassador, of your top five strengths, which of them have you used most throughout your career? I normally think of my strengths as an amalgam of who I am. And um, if I had to just pick out one from that amalgam, I would say probably learner. Uh, I feel like I'm more a lifetime learner than anything else. Uh, but I like to think of myself as a, a blend of all of those things together, that it makes me me, you know, having that combination. If one of those things were different, then I wouldn't be me today. And some of the achievements that I've had, luckily have had throughout my life, may have played out differently. So I would like to think of them as a, an amalgam of myself. Uh, but picking one, I would probably say that that's very important to me is the, is the learner because I feel like I'm a lifelong learner no matter what it is, whether it's something academically, whether it's something uh, life lessons, you know, whether it's something strategically or politically or policy related or culturally related. Uh, all of those things sort of make me get up in the morning. Now, another great strength of learners is when they re-communicate to others, when they share with others what it is that they've learned. How do you successfully communicate what you've learned and who do you seek to communicate it to? Then I would say that, um, you know, when I look at other avenues of my life, even, you know, through the friends that I've had for years, it really is that people know that I'm sincere uh, and that I'm straightforward. Um, I'm not a big talker, though, uh, and, um, and I think that the, the sincerity and the integrity that comes across, I think, it helps me do that. And, um, and so when I look at sort of the things I do socially or culturally, I think all of that comes together because uh, I'm just a regular old person, you know. I, there's the job, and I try never to let the job uh, lapse over into my personal life or into things that I do with my friends or anything like that. So I think that that's important. Uh, you know, I, you know, when I talk to young people, I always say to them, you know, make sure that you have a life. You know, you can have all of this, but make sure that you also have a life um, because that makes you a whole person. And I think that that's, you know, a key thing that sometimes gets lost you know, as you look at what you want to do for your career path. Now, you talked a lot about your friends. You do have a very wide circle of friends. And you also lead with individualization. People with individualization have an unusual ability to understand somebody's soul. How is it that you use individualization to get to know people so well? You know, when I look back, if I just sort of slice out my diplomatic career for a moment to answer that question, I would say that my individualization was key in be, being able to connect to uh, people in, in refugee camps that I had to go and, 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 and um, visit to making sure that I understood the culture of a country or a culture of the village or because, you know, there's not a cookie cutter approach to this. You have to go into, at least my, my perception is, you have to go into a country with a tabla rasa, uh, that you don't come in with any preconceived notions, that you come in with an understanding that I'm here as a guest. I may work for the U.S. government, but I'm a guest in your country. And so I, I want to be able to be respectful. Uh, we can have a difference of view. Uh, we can certainly have a difference of perception and all of that, but... I want to respect you as a guest in your country. And so I made the triple, quadruple effort to just go to any village that I could, you know, all, you know, all, in every country I serve. I mean, I've used Nigeria a lot as an example, but I did that in Sudan. I did it in Congo. I did it in Portugal. Um, I did it in Namibia. And so I felt like then I could, I could interpret the economic, political development challenges and the everyday challenges, just like I would here um, uh, in the U.S. And those same skills, um, if I call them skills, let me just say that same part of me 
uh, I do living here in the U.S. You know, I want to understand everybody's view. You know, uh, I tell people, I used to tell my staff, you know, democracies are messy. They're not meant to be straightforward. That's not, and it's not about everybody thinking the same way. That's just not what it's about. And so I just, that same skill set I use in my everyday life here as well. As a U.S. ambassador and you've engaged diplomats all over the world, how did you use your individualization with them? Um, for the most part, connecting as an individual. You know, yes, we are representing our, our countries, but, you know, how do we, you know, connect as an individual? Um, and so, you know, I try, to, I try to do that across the board, whether someone is, a, a, you know, a, a chief of mission or, you know, or, um, you know, in any capacity. So I would say, you know, just trying to connect as an individual. In Gallup's research, we found that of the four needs of followers, one of the most critical needs is compassion. Can you talk about how you've demonstrated compassion or what advice you would have for a leader that said, I need to get better at demonstrating compassion? Yeah, you know, I think some of the examples we've talked about uh, today in terms of, of uh, you know, understanding and, and um, understanding the culture that you're living in, being able to listen or wanting to listen, but not just listening, but hearing, hearing what someone is telling you, not just listening, but he really hearing, even if you uh, have a completely different worldview. Um, and I say that, let me put a caveat, because, you know, I don't want people to interpret that comment as a, a carte blanche on human rights violations, on on you know anything that's untoward um, in in any way to human life or uh, to someone's well-being. But when I say listen, I mean, in order for you to even come up with a strategy, you have to be able to understand the perspective of the person that that's across the table from you, even if it's it's a a, a perspective that is abhorrent to you. You've got to be able to understand it or understand, um, or, or at least be aware of how deep it might be. Other than that, you're not going to be able to find a way out. Um, so compassion, to me, goes hand in hand with that. Um, and when you take away, I used to say, when you dehumanize an individual, you can do anything to them. And... Um, you know, I, I've seen that in, in some circumstances. And um, so you're, you're right, compassion, you have to have compassion for your, your fellow human being. Because once you don't have that, then you can do anything. And we've seen that. We've seen that in conflicts throughout the world. When you work with people, whether it's at your organization feeds, whether it's been at one of your embassies in the past, how is it that you bring out the best in others? We well, have to ask them how I bring out the best in others. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that I have. Uh, you know, I strive to do that. And, um, you know, you have to give people a space to be who they are. Uh, you have to also balance that with keeping things on task. Uh, but you have to be... The, the same kind of, um, I want kindness and the same kind of, of balance that I described earlier, you have to have with people that, um, that either you work with, work for, or that you want to work with. And so, you know, I take the term diplomacy seriously. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, I try to, to live that in just about every capacity of my life, if I can. Um, and so I think that if you are a, a leader, I think the, you know, the best leaders that I have ever worked for have been the nicest people also that I've worked for. Now, you also have strategic in your mm -hmm. top five. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how a diplomat uses strategic, especially with respect to foreign policy? 
Yeah, I think it's an interesting one to have uh, delineated like that because I always thought of myself as a strategic thinker. You know, uh, you know, you know what's what's ten steps ahead or what's five steps ahead, and so you know, um, I having been a person who recently took their strength, um, it was ex interesting to me because it made me very reflective on some of the things that, that I've done throughout, or decisions that I've made throughout, uh, throughout my life. And so I think that strategic is a huge part of who I am as a professional because I, I, I do want to think five and ten steps ahead if I can. And I used to call it, when working with my staff, I used to say, you know, what's the cuff list? You mean, you know, the cuff on a, on a uh, sleeve? You know, let's at least think that far out. You know, it may not be hard and fast. Uh, sometimes in policy circles it's called um, a, uh, a, um, uh, a trip list or a trigger list. You know, what are the triggers that may cause X, Y, and Z? Uh, I'm not that formal necessarily in, you know, in, in, in my day-to-day -day work per se, but I always try to think four or five steps ahead, even if I don't sort of make it into a formal uh, uh, trip list or trigger list. Um, and so when I see things happening throughout the world, I'm saying, how, how didn't someone ha at least have that on a list, even on the back of a napkin list of a potential outcome? So what are the unintended consequences? And I think that where we have challenges, almost any government, is when we haven't thought about the unintended consequences. Uh, um, and yeah, I think that's important. And, you know, I think that for um, my experience, you know, having, even if it's informal, just having that thought process five or ten steps ahead, maybe ten is too far, but it's certainly, you know, from the one to five area, you, if you're in a strategic position, you should at least do that. People with strategic often have multiple plans ready yeah. for whatever takes place, right. as you mentioned, five to ten steps ahead. Mm -hmm. How do you know when you've arrived at the right strategy for something? When it works. <laughs> <laughs> But if it doesn't work, then you, you have you, you, on, your, on your list, on your cuff list, then, you know, you, you should be able to pivot. You know, you've got to also be able to pivot. And you also have to be flexible enough to know that, you know, maybe everything on your cheat sheet is, is, is not going to happen or is not, the, is not the right trajectory. And you have to be flexible. Flexibility is equally as important as everything else. Talk about how you use a ranger because a lot of times strategic is how one sets up the plan and uh, a ranger is sort of how you set that plan in motion. Talk about how those two interact with each other for you. For me it's got to be, um, there's got to be a, like a, a, a bifold perception. You've got to have that one to five or five to ten, as I said I think ten is probably too far. Let's do the one to five example. Uh, you've got to be able to pivot, which means you've got to be able to rearrange. And so, uh, you know, whether you, you, you have someone on your staff who is your chief of staff or your, you know, political lead or your economic lead, you want them to be thinking along those lines. And, you know, when you have in your meetings, you're, you're talking about the, the what ifs, you know. And, uh, you know, in a lot of places that I've lived and served, you know, the, the what-ifs were really critical, you know, were really critical. Um, you know, not to eat up the time, but, you know, there's, there's, I'm not sure I've shared this story with you before, but the, um, it was in Congo, actually, where we were given the wrong directions coming out of a, a transitional area of the country that had been at, uh, had a lot of conflict, and we were given the wrong directions to get back, and, and we had these, gentlemen come out of the the bush area with their aka 47s and um uh and so i could see them coming out we were had not quite reached their roadblock and i was in the back seat and i had really two great uh uh, uh people with me uh, that worked for me at the embassy there and um as we were approaching i i just said don't say anything about the embassy. Don't say anything about me. Don't say 
anything about what they want, just listen to what they they want, and uh, and if we can accommodate what they want uh, in a way that doesn't lead us into conflict or get us kidnapped, then we will do that. And uh, But I said, you know, I am just uh, a, you know, quietly sitting in the back seat, um, minding my own business. Uh, they don't have to know that I'm American. They don't have to know anything about me. You know, you are two males. You know, you're going to have a conversation with them. And hopefully that will get us out of uh, a difficult environment. And it, that's what it did. So, but I could see them coming out in enough time to say to the team in front of me, okay, you know, I'm not the ambassador in this circumstance. Don't mention me. You know, I am subordinate to what's going on. Uh, and this is the only way I think that uh, we can get out of this without having a difficult environment. Talk more about moments of adversity throughout your life. What are some of the most sort of significant challenges that you faced, and what strength or strengths did you use in order to overcome those obstacles? You know, I get asked that like a lot, and it's one of the questions that I, I, I won't say I struggle with, but it always baffles me to a, to an extent because I came out of a very strong family environment that was supportive, protective. My father was career military, as you know, and so I lived abroad most of my formative years. And so there's not an obstacle that I can identify that that wasn't sort of, I, I want to say, cushioned somehow by my, my parents that I wasn't aware that it was even there. And so um, it sounds a little Pollyannish, you know, as a response, but it's an honest response. And I get asked that literally all the time. I don't have a by the bootstrap story to tell. Hmm. I just don't, you know, and, um, and I credit my, my folks for that. That's all I can say. But do you think it's some element of extreme uh, resiliency? Because you just shared a story about a time when you potentially were facing a threat of violence as ambassador, and yet you didn't reflect on that as a moment of adversity. I didn't reflect on it as a moment of adversity. You just have to think your way out of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know that that doesn't always work. I'm not, I, I really don't mean to be light about that, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, there are circumstances that, you know, it could have done, could have done a 360, could have turned out completely differently. Um, so I don't want to, to give an impression that I'm making a light of that at all. But in response to your particular question, um, I was thinking that you were asking me in the context of, you know, did I have obstacles growing up I kind see. of thing. And so <clears throat> I, I don't have a by the bootstraps uh, 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 story to tell in that regard. You, you know, sure, you know, through some of the places that I've served, you know, there were, you know, difficult environments. Um, did I look at that as an adversity, though? I just looked at that as the cost of doing business. Another one of Gallup's leadership demands is the ability to think critically. You've done that extensively. Your strengths have uh, demonstrated that over the years. What advice would you have to an aspiring leader on how they can think critically? Um, I, I think that what's important is to understand past your own analysis. You know, sometimes we get wrapped up in our own analysis of something and we don't allow other things to come in. Uh, and um, if you do that, then the probability of you missing something is, is high, at least in my estimation. So, yes, you know, think through, uh, you know, the challenges that are before you and that you and your team talk about um, and that you see, but what aren't you seeing that might be there? Right now, the demands of leadership are increasing dramatically. In fact, I think it was Axios that said this is the hardest time to run an organization. But now that we're faced with artificial intelligence, climate change, 
haptic technology, biotech, of all the things that leaders need to be focused on in terms of what they should be learning about, what advice would you have for them? What should they be focused on learning about? So I think there are the immediate things. Um, you know, what's on the, what I would put on the cuff list, I think is harder these days. Because, you know, 18 months ago, I wouldn't have guessed a conflict in, in Ukraine. You know, I'm not sure um, who might have had that on their cuff list. Mm. I don't know. Maybe somebody in Ukraine might have. I don't know. Uh, so I think what should be on your list at the top is unpredictability. I think we're in a globally unpredictable environment. Would you have said, uh, without naming an institution, that you know we had a hiccup in the banking sector, you know, what, six months ago? So I think the watchword is unpredictability, and you just have to be. Maybe companies need to hire somebody that just looks at unpredictability. You know. Remember, I would say five or six years ago, you didn't have sort of the chief transformation or, you know, you have all of these new um, uh, positions in companies now as things have changed in the world. And so maybe we need, we need a, a, a person or a small division that that's what they do in a company. If I were a head of a company, um, I don't care what sector, I would probably look at having someone, maybe the person that would be my transformation would also be looking at, um, you know, he or she would be looking at, you know, if you had to predict, you know, something that would be so far from the norm today, what would be on that list? Uh, so it goes back to, to trying to think ahead. But I'd say right now, it, it, it's just everything is unpredictable. I gave a speech not too long ago or a keynote lecture at um, one of the U.S. War Colleges uh, a couple, at the end of last year, actually. And one of the things I talked about was, you know, the unpredictability of things and the importance of multilateralism and, um, and how we're going to stay together as a global world, I, I don't see that without improved multilateralism. Right now, I see more um, organizational or, or country grouping silos. Um, when I say silos, I mean uh, groupings around the world that um, uh, where we're not a part of. And I said to the, to the uh, mostly colonels um, in the audience, including visiting um, colonels from about 20 nations were also there, that, you know, if we as the U.S. are not in some of these groupings, then we're on the menu. And, um, and so I worry about that because I see more and more of these world groupings that we're not a part of. For a lot of successful people throughout their lives, they had someone who helped them identify their strengths and also develop their strengths. Did you have someone do that for you? And if so, how did they help you identify and grow those strengths successfully? You know, it's funny. Um, you know, I find that, you know, an intriguing question. And one of the things that I think about a lot is how lucky I was to have the parents that I had. I don't give anybody credit for that but my folks. Uh, you know, my interest in, in education and uh, my uh, interest in culture and my energy and my worldview, um, you know, they, they are responsible for all of that. And I give them so much credit because they, not only they deserve it, but I'm just proud that they made me the person I am today. And, uh, you know, the, the experience of being a, um, a uh, daughter of a, a military person, you know, has its um, framework on me in terms of discipline and um, uh, it gave me a worldview. It gave me exposure to culture all of my formative years. And so different cultures and living in different environments um, all of my formative years. And I think those things, when I look at myself and my sisters, were 
very similar in terms of our interests. You know, we all love we all love culture, and we all love to do cultural events together, and we all love of um, you know learning and and being educated and being involved and contributing to community our community and all of those things. And then the other thing, and this really goes to my mom, um, is that we love sports. You know, <laughs> my father is not a sports person, but the the, the my sisters and I are we're like diehard sports um, fans. But my mother was, and my grandmother was, and so um, were they fans of the NFL too. They were fans of literally, and they were more than just fans. They were statisticians on stuff. Mm. I mean, they knew you know, uh, particularly on football, uh, baseball. Uh, hockey to some extent, uh, certainly tennis, you know, uh, they could quote years and years and years back. And so, you know, the teams that I like today, you know, are uh, a product of, of, you know, all of that. So we're, you know, we're three, you know, sisters that are diehard sports fans. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. And that comes from them. But anyway, the, the person I am and all the elements that you have, uh, talked about today and all of my strength that really belongs to my folks. Ambassador, thank you for everything that you do for Gallup. Thank you for everything you do for this country and thank you for everything that you do for the world and thank you for being here today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.